Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the debate on ethics and morality for robots. Uh, this event is part of the Federated Logic Conference, uh, which is running in Oxford uh, last week and this week. Uh, and this is a public event. It is called the Logic Lounge. And the events were initiated by Helmut Weiss uh, at Flock, the Federated Logic Conference, uh, the edition in, 19, uh, in 2014. And they've been running uh, every year since in association with the uh, Computer Aided Verification Conference. So this year, we are running the event in Oxford, and next year it will be in New York. And now I would like to ask Judy to take over. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is... Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Judy Wiseman. I'm a professor of sociology at the London School of Economics, and I've been involved for many years um, in developing the social studies of science and technology. Um, I'm just back for a, from a year in Silicon Valley, and I was very struck by what a hot topic this is. I mean, whether it's the partnership on um, AI, the IEEE, the European Union, uh, the recent House of Lords uh, report um, on AI in the UK, this does seem to be really the kind of hot topic of the moment, the issue of the moment. And actually, as I was um, in Stanford, there was a lot of discussion about introducing courses for all of the uh, computer science and engineering um, students. Um, to study um, ethics and social responsibility of science. And I thought to myself, well, better late than never, I say. Um, I was also, um, I also signed um, a letter with many, many other academics supporting the Google workers who were uh, protesting about working on the uh, military project Maven. And soon afterwards, the project was canceled. And, some Amazon workers, I gather, are also now um, taking up various issues of the work they're doing on facial recognition and other things. So this debate really couldn't be more timely, and uh, we couldn't have a better panel. We have the most amazing, wonderful panel for this evening. Um, and, um, you know, the idea is that we're going to have a productive conversation, actually, rather than the sort of acrimonious debate that sometimes happens, um, you know, in this chamber. And we're going to leave a good half an hour for uh, participation and questions from the audience, because we've got um, a lot of very knowledgeable uh, people in the audience, and we'd really like to kind of maximise the opportunity um, for participation. So I'm going to introduce the speakers uh, very briefly, and I hope they'll excuse me um, for doing this. Um, to my right is Luciano um, Floridi, who's a professor of ethics um, and philosophy at the University of Oxford. Um, next to him is Francesca Rossi, uh, professor of computer science at Padova, the University of Padova. Uh, ben uh, Coopers is at the end. Um, he's a professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Michigan. Um, on my left is uh, Matthias Schutz, a professor of computer science from Tufts. Um, Jeanette Wing, who is the Avanasian Director of Data Sciences at Columbia. Um, and Sandra uh, Watcher, who's um, a lawyer and philosophy at the, philosopher at the University of Oxford. Um, we've structured, we've had a lot of discussion about how to structure this conversation, but what we've decided uh, to do is that we discussed various questions that we thought might work, and I'm going to, so I prepared some questions, and I'm going to give um, each speaker exactly three minutes, and we have a timekeeper here, uh, to respond uh, to these questions. And I'm hoping that, you know, we'll do that for the first hour, and that'll give us a good range of um, issues and some stimulating topics um, to discuss, and then we'll have plenty of time um, for questions. So I hope it works, is all I can say at this point. Um, so the first question um, that we've agreed on um, is the following. What are the political challenges caused by new forms of machine agency? What are the political challenges caused by new forms of machine agency? So, um, 
you didn't want to start first, did you? Did you ask? Okay, I will start at the, on the right end. And we'll work our way across, and then for the next one, I'll start at the other end. That seems equitable. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're looking at a situation where robots and other AIs may take an increasing role in our society. So when they perceive their environment, make decisions about how to act, they're participating. They are functioning as members of our society. And so one of the things that we want is for agents like this to behave ethically. But as we're developing robots, in order to accomplish this, we have to know what ethics is. And we have to know it in a way that people who design robots can usefully use in that design. And that this is going to shed light on what ethics is for both humans and for robots, I believe. So a hypothesis that I'm working on is that ethics is a society's way to encourage its individual members to engage in positive sum, that is cooperative activities, and to encourage them to avoid negative sum, that is exploitative activities. Some ethical principles, like keep your promises, help individuals identify trustworthy partners for collaborative projects. And that's how positive sum interactions take place. There are other <coughs> kinds of ethical principles, and let me just pick one, like protect children from harm. Um, as we follow those principles, we establish a behavioral invariant or near invariant that we can count on to make life safer and easier. Um, now, <clears throat> as individuals, and when I say individuals, think about humans and robots and perhaps other things. As they follow ethical principles in their behavior, what they're doing is they're witnessing to the importance of those principles. Helping other members of the society trust that they can count on everyone else in certain ways. Now, when individuals, either humans or robots, violate ethical principles and exploit each other for individual gain, then individuals lose trust in each other, not just in that particular interaction, and the society as a whole suffers from those negative sum outcomes. So if we end up creating robots that violate the ethical principles that maintain our society, then we'll suffer and the society in the long run could even fail. So we need to determine ethical principles, rules, constraints, virtues, and so forth, that will allow our society to thrive. And then we need to find ways to build these into our robots. So I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so I... I um... Following what uh, Ben said, I really think that in the future, you know, AI, and here we're talking about robots, but I talk about AI in general, both software and hardware <clears throat> machines, will be working with us much more, you know, on a regular basis. Will be helping us in our private and professional life do whatever we do uh, better, you know, better meaning you know, making better decisions because they are more, uh, we will have access to more information that uh, machines can help us, you know, digest and, and handle. Um, so really, the, uh, that is a trend that I don't think can be stopped. So in that vision of the future, of course, uh, as Ben said, you want to build a system of trust between us and machines. And to build this system of trust, you have to make sure that you understand each other. You have to make sure that you build a team, effective teamwork between the human and the machine working with that human. Like, just think about uh, a doctor um, who is going to be helped by a decision support system who is, that is helping him understand what's the best therapy or the best diagnosis for a patient. And so these two entities, the doctor and the decision support system, should really be a team, 
and help each other. And there are evidence and use cases that show that really this is the best that you can do by putting together machines and humans together. You get a much better, uh, much less error, for example, in diagnosing something. And this is because humans and machines are very complementary. There are things that we do much better than machines, and there are things that machines can do much better than us. So we really need to exploit this complementarity. Having said that, of course, to create this uh, system of trust, you need to make sure that these machines follow the same ethical principles that uh, humans are supposed to follow. Again, in the doctor case, uh, do you, we know that doctors should follow some ethical guidelines in his job, so if you want to have a doctor being helped by a decision support system, also that decision support system should be at least aware and follow also the same ethical guidelines. Otherwise, the doctor would not trust whatever recommendation it receives. So value alignment and ethical principle alignment is very important. Another important capability that you need to in, be able to inject into machines is the capability to explain why is suggesting humans to do something and not something else, so explainability. And this one is something that is not yet we didn't yet under, understand, as AI researcher, how to do that. In terms of political challenges, you know, how do we regulate these machines that will work and live with us? Well, who needs to regulate it? Which values do you want to put? That, to me, is a, very, is a discussion that cannot be resolved at the level of AI people that uh, will find the, uh, the technical solution, but can only be done in a very multi-stakeholder way. Those that produce AI, but also those that will be impacted by AI. I'll stop here because they say <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, and just in case, I also start my own time. Oh. Um, <laughs> trying to address the, the question, which was, uh, what are the political challenges caused by new forms of machine age agency? So on the uh, 5th of July, uh, we met in Paris. Uh, Matt Hancock was there. Uh, we met with a, a French delegation to sign an agreement on AI. Uh, you can tell the politicians are heavily involved. Why? Well, politics can be a, a thousand different things, but one thing that it is, is uh, the management of power to influence decisions. Now, imagine that together with a technology that actually contributes to managing decisions, AI. And all of a sudden, you have quite a mix uh, sort of element here of potential uh, advantage or explosion. Now, because uh, the question is quite precise, let me give you uh, three cases where AI could have a huge impact. Control, delegation, nudging. Who controls what? When and how do we delegate a technology to control what? And what happens when nudging happens quietly, silently, invisibly, because the AI is there from day one. And poor Johnny, who was born yesterday, has been nudged by this invisible AI 24-7, every month, every year, for the past 25 years. Um, so these are corners where politics is going to change. Now, it's changing so dramatically uh, that um, these days, uh, wearing a different hat uh, at the Alan Ewing Turing Institute, which is, as you know, the British Institute for Data uh, Science and uh, AI, we receive, and I need to be a bit vague, as you may imagine, a uh, request by the socio-political side to join forces with people who do have control of the AI and the data behind the AI to help them to deal with social issues. For example, Suppose you want to know more about domestic violence. Who has the data and the processing power, also in terms of artificial intelligence, to get that data and that knowledge clear? Well, not exactly necessarily your no, round the corner office. So we can see that what is happening here, if, back to the original point, politics is also the management of power to influence social decisions, once you have about uh, on the board and other forms of agency, well then all of a sudden you know that the agency is going to interact positively or negatively with that force. Ethics is about making sure that it interacts positively. Thank you. Thanks. Um, to answer that question, what the uh, 
political challenges are of different levels of machine agency, I think we need to think about what we mean by different levels of agency. There are simple robots that we have around today, like vacuum cleaning robots, for example. There's no challenge in regulating anything, right? There are safety measures that we have in place. They have a job to do, and there is really no agency that we can speak of in those machines. But there will be other ones. There will be other robots that uh, will be employed in elder care settings, for example. They will be able to watch people. They will have to make maybe limited decisions about what uh, medication to administer. In those cases, the robot will be much more sophisticated. We'll have to have much more understanding of the environment it's in, what kind of decisions are appropriate and inappropriate. And then we have to see what kind of agency that is. And that goes also with the notion of responsibility. What if that robot screws up? Who's responsible for it? Uh, I think the political challenge is going to be first to even agree on what these levels of agencies, uh, uh, different agency are. Uh, we'll have to talk to AI people, but even AI people will not necessarily know what those are, and we have to talk to philosophers. It'll be a very complex discussion to figure out what the capabilities are of a given system, right? What it actually can do and potentially can do, and as a result, how its actions are connected to various different other concepts, such as, as I said, uh, responsibility. Uh, agreeing then uh, within a country is going to be complicated, but across different countries will probably even be more complicated. And what do you do when a system uh, screws up? Do you punish it? Is there such a notion of punishing it? Uh, figuring out what the expectations are of a system, what you can reasonably expect the system to do or not to do, uh, is part of the challenge that I think we need to address here. So, all in all, uh, I, th I think there's a really important philosophical point about the notion of agency, what it means for a system to have agency in the first place that we need to address. And then all these other ensuing questions uh, will come later. Thank you very much. I'm Jeanette Wing, and I wanted to address what I think is a very important political challenge that Judy alluded to by mentioning Project Maven. I, wanted to talk, I want to talk about cyber warfare. To preface, in the geopolitical world, cyber warfare does not yet have an answer to whether a cybersecurity attack is an act of war. So even in the context without robots, we have some ambiguity. So weaponized robots, especially those that are purely digital, adds more degrees of ambiguity to this already difficult question. Let's all acknowledge that robots can be weaponized. Just think of drones already used in physical attacks. What are some of the new challenges? Let me discuss two. Wearing my research cybersecurity hat on, the first is hacking robots. And the second is rules of engagement, which I think the legal community has a lot to speak about. First, I worry a lot about hacking robots. It's very easy to do. In the context of cyber warfare, robots can be hacked, and thus weaponized robots can be hacked. For AI used to make these robots more smart or smarter, we know how easy it is to fool machine learning systems, we know how easy it is to modify those parameters. Today, this morning, I heard about DeepMind's one billion parameter model. It's going to be very easy to modify any one of those billion parameters. So robots in warfare are simply another attack vector. Second, what are the rules of engagement in the battlefield? Consider first physical robots. Can robots make ethical decisions to kill people? Does a reduced human role in targeting decisions change the way we approach warfare? At the same time, should we not deploy AI-driven systems and robots if that results in fewer human harms? For example, they are more accurate, less prone to misidentification than human targeters. Then would we not ethically be obligated to use them? Maybe it's okay if robots kill robots. Maybe it's even better if all our physical battles are fought with robots. But what about the situation where we have humans and robots on the battlefield at the same time? Second, let's consider digital bots. The DARPA cyber challenge 
of 2016 had bots finding and patching bugs in never before analyzed software in real time, faster than what any human could do in a capture the flag competition. This capability brings us back to the first question. Is a cyber attack an act of war? Digital technology, more generally, is leveling the playing field globally. It cuts both ways. For example, bad guys are as smart and have the same access to technology as good guys. So it is as easy for terrorists and insurgents to deploy smart weapons as it is for the good guys. On the other hand, it is also easier for populations to monitor their governments. That's the opposite of 1984. Uh, this capability can produce instability and political challenges, good and bad. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I see two very big challenges, especially with um, increasing levels of autonomy. I think one has to do with accountability and liability, and the other thing has to do that problems that we already have might be exacerbated over time. From a legal perspective, it has always been very clear who should be held liable if they do something bad. If I use a weapon or if I use a knife to hurt you, it's very clear that I'm going to be liable. I'm using a conscious act to hurt you. Well, with the increasing levels of autonomy, that's not still the case anymore. We have robots that often act autonomously, often act unpredictable, and this has been prompting a discussion where people try to free themselves from liability and say, well, I didn't control that system, so I shouldn't be held liable. We see this discussion especially with autonomous cars, where people are trying to figure out, should it be the driver who is held responsible? Should it be the coder who coded the software? Should it be the factorer? or just the person who sold you that. And we haven't have any consensus about that right now. So people have suggested, well, let's just get an insurance system, right? So whenever a robot harms somebody, you should be held liable for that. But in fact, that's just kicking the, the can further down the road, because at a certain point, the insurance might pay. But insurance don't pay off, out of the goodness of their heart. They want to regress at some point. So they're going to go to court and try to find somebody to blame. So the, the things that we don't decide now with legislation or guidelines will be decided by judges and that will increase um, uncertainty. The second problem has to do that it might increase problems that we already have. Two of them are discrimination and privacy invasions. So autonomous robots or robots in general often work with sensors, they work with machine learning, um, they work with algorithms and the data that they use is either biased or the algorithm is biased which the sensors are not really good. That could lead to more trivial things, like you have a soap dispenser that automatically detects if a hand is under it, but is not able to detect any hands that are not white, to more problematic situations where you have facial recognition software that is not able to detect any, anyone that is not white. So that's increasing discrimination at a certain level. And in addition, we have a privacy concern because a lot of those robots need a lot of data. Autonomous cars need a lot of data. They need to interact with each other, with the infrastructure, um, to navigate. But that information also gives very, very clear implications for your private life. Who do you visit? Um, how long do you take to work? And that information can be very interesting for insurance companies and employers. So we have situations where problems are increasing, but liability uh, is not so clear anymore, and I think we need to address both those things together. I mean, thank you very much. I mean, you've all um, raised uh, lots of issues. Um, it seems to me that one of the things that, that um, you've all talked about, a theme that goes through all of it, is trust and, and moral responsibility, which relates to the sort of issue of agency and who is going to be responsible. And so I think it's a sort of easy segue to the next question, which is actually about regulation, is that one of the answers to the problem of kind of trust and um, responsibility? So the second question um, that we agreed on is what are the similarities and differences in governance when regulating AI and robots versus humans? The similarities and differences in governance when regulating um, AI and robots versus humans? And I wondered if um, somebody might just offer this rather than going in the the same order. Would somebody like to go first, or will I start at this end? And perhaps I'll. Huh? Start at this end. 
Well, Sandra's just spoken, so I thought... That's fine, that... I do it. Huh? I do it, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, I think um, AI and robotics and humans have a couple of things in common. So, what they do at the moment, they very often make very important decisions about us. So we have, for example, a doctor who diagnoses us or gives us a treatment plan. Um, we have people, we have doctors operating on us. We have judges who decide if we should go to prison um, and if we should be granted parole. We have the police who is trying to um, investigate crime, uh, crimes. Now those things are being increasingly done by AI and robots now. So we have doctors who use expert systems for treatment plans now. We have surgical robots operating on humans. We have predictive um, policing software that is trying to investigate crime. And we have algorithms that help for sentencing, um, help judges sentencing. So that's interesting that they are increasingly doing the same thing. It's also very interesting that both of them are black boxes in a certain way. If a human makes a decision if somebody should go to prison, I'm really not sure why it make the decision. It might give me some reason that can be true, cannot be true, maybe the person doesn't even know. In the same situation we have with algorithms, we very often don't know what you do with certain things, and sometimes if we do know, maybe companies don't want to tell you because of intellectual property rights and trade secrets. So, they do very similar things. What the difference is is the way that we perceive it. I feel like that we are more um, critical towards humans at the moment. We have smart, we, we call those technologies smart. We say smart cities, smartphones, artificial intelligence. So there's always a connotation that those systems are smart. We don't necessarily think that every human is smart a priori. And if those systems, or if a robot, or if a human makes a decision and I'm not happy with that, I want to have an explanation. If a human is not able to explain their actions, I'm not going to trust them anymore. I might even fire that person. With algorithms, it's a bit different. We are more lenient and say those systems are very complicated, so we let them get away with that, and I think that's interesting. It only shifts a bit if we embed software in um, autonomous systems and where there is actual physical harm, then we actually stand up and do something. So I think it's very important that we hold algorithms to the same account that we hold humans, at least, and that we also acknowledge that non-physical harm can also be problematic just as much as physical harm. So I'm not going to be three minutes. Um, what are the similarities and differences in governance when regulating AI and robots versus humans? And I just want to make two points. One of them, uh, Sandra already made it in answering the first question. The first point I want to make is that regulating AI and robotics is actually very difficult to do. And there are some uh, obvious reasons. The first is that the technology itself moves really quickly. Uh, the advances that we have made in just the past five years in terms of the applications and also the methods in AI and machine learning are astounding, absolutely astounding. And, I can, and, and regulation simply cannot keep up with the technology. Um, there's always been a tension between what is done in the legal community and, and passing laws and regulation and the technology community. Um, for good reason, the legal community actually doesn't want to make a lot of laws. They want to make a law that's going to last forever. And by definition, technology is moving like this. That's in our nature as people who develop technology. So there's just this, this uh, disconnect um, between even thinking about regulating the kind of technology we're talking about. The second is regulation is actually difficult to enforce because technology, the kind of digital technology we're talking about, can be de developed anywhere, like overseas, and disseminated to anywhere, like in an email message. So how do you regulate something like that? And the other two points I wanted to make are a little more mundane, and you've heard them before. Um, everything that's based on machine learning and AI is not easily verifiable. In fact, I think that's a great a challenge problem to the flock community, um, or understandable. That's why DARPA, for instance, created an explainable AI program. Um, and uh, this, the technology isn't even understandable by its own creators. The second is that restrictions on data collection make it even harder to test 
And that's actually what we want to do. When you talk about unbi uh, biased algorithms, what's making the machine learned models biased is the data that's being fed into the algorithms. So what we really need to test is, is the data biased or not? How do you do that? Well, that's another challenge, I think, to, for the flock community. The second point I wanted to make is about accountability, which Sandra already said a lot about. It's not clear who or what to hold accountable if harm comes to humans. We can hold humans and organizations accountable for their actions, but what about robots? Um, who is accountable for what a robot does? To what or whom does the regulation apply? The robot, well, what does it mean to punish a robot? The human who built the physical device, the human who built the software, smarts, the human who invented the algorithm, Thank you. Um, yes, please. Um, and maybe in the best of the Oxford Union, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid I have to disagree with my honorable colleague. <laughs> uh, first of all, regulations are not, don't be fooled, are not about speed. They are about direction. You don't regulate to catch up with technology. You regulate to tell technology where to go. And if you like where you're going, well, the faster you go there, the better. So please, do not endorse for a moment the thesis that, possibly coming from, uh, shall we say, uh, Silicon Valley, all technology, you can't regulate it because you can never catch it. Who speaks about catching? I'm uh, driving it. So that's what regulations does. As for implementation called compliance, ladies and gentlemen, please, do not buy the thesis that you cannot implement it. Have you seen what happened to Facebook recently? 500,000 pounds fee uh, because they didn't do the right thing? And have you seen what happens in Brussels when Google, Microsoft, and anyone else makes a mistake? There are painful costs for their mistake. They also called GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. So on the second point, I'm afraid, uh, not to be taken. And finally, on the last point, accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not buy the thesis that this is impossible for the simple reason that even law has already saw that a long time ago. Think of pharmaceutical industry or the car industry. Who is responsible for those emissions that didn't quite work? Well, it's called also, in corners, that some of you know very well, strict liability. In other words, everybody, unless you prove me, you weren't there in the first place. So from complex places like big pharma or the car industry or the oil industry, we learn the hard way that one, regulate, two, direct, three, make accountable. That is the society in which you want to live. Thank you. Well, that's good. We're getting a bit of um, you know, disagreement and debate. I'm afraid there's no right of um, reply at the moment. Um, <laughs> but you know, there may be in the discussion. But, um, who would like to, does anyone want to follow directly? Or we just, yeah, are you happy? Unless somebody else wants yep. to. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yep. All right. Uh, I, I'd like to come back to the notion of uh, what we mean by robot and what we mean by AI. And that, that sort of changes depending on who you ask. If you ask people these days what AI is, for most people it's deep neural networks and, and, and learning, right? Uh, but that's not all there is to AI. There are various different areas that are subsumed under the field. And when we talk about regulating AI, we have to be very clear on what it is that we're referring to. I take it that part of what we're worried about is, is unconstrained machine learning. That could be data-driven machine learning, could be partly knowledge-based or data-driven. But it's the machine learning where the machine can come up with a behavior that was not anticipated that we might not want from the machine, right? That, that where, that's where we see problems. There's no problems with robots that uh, act according to specifications, that don't do that kind of learning where you know exact, exactly ahead of time what that robot's going to do. Now, it may well be that in some cases, in some application domains, we will have to use machine learning on the fly, for example, for the system to be able to overcome obstacles or deal with uh, contingencies in the task. And then the question is, is what kind of behavior can that system have? 
Take a natural language instructed robot. If you can feed that robot on the fly natural language, new information that the system can use right away, then the question is to what extent that system should be able to think about the consequences of using that information that it was given. The information may not be truthful, the information may be biased, right? There are all these issues that, that, that come along with those kinds of systems. Uh, and, and, and the same way that AI doesn't equal AI and robots don't equal robots, the, and, and different levels of autonomy have different requirements, I think it's important to, to be very clear on what it is and what kind of system it is that we are talking about when we are talking about governments, especially vis-a-vis -vis humans. Thank you. Um, who'd like to go next? Just, yes, sure. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that uh, when uh, we're talking about regulating a technology, not just AI, uh, and I agree with uh, uh, Luciano, that the, that the regulation should be, you know, about a vision when we want to go with that technology, uh, so driving it in the right direction. But when we talk about regulation, there is not one way to regulate a technology. There is a collection of possible ways, hard laws, soft laws, a code of conduct, guidelines. I see in the audience Paula Boddington, who is here, who wrote a very nice book about the code of conduct for AI systems. And there are many principles that various communities or sets of different stakeholders put together. Uh, the partnership on AI that you mentioned before has eight tenets on how AI should or should not be used. Uh, a conference in Asilomar last year put together 23 principles about the uses of AI. And then there are hard laws like the GDPR that talks about the data subject and the rights of the data subject and the right for Explain, explanation and so on. So, and then there are the market uh, pressures. For example, in terms of fairness and bias of the algorithms, that is something that people are very concerned about because it's a concrete uh, um, current issue to be resolved. Uh, and I think that more and more uh, companies are are producing products and deploying products to the real world. And by the way, I'm from the University of Padua, but actually since three years I've been at IBM, so I talk about companies because I'm in a company as well. So more and more companies are uh, deploying products that uh, are uh, audited in terms of the bias that they present or not, you know, contextually, you know, in the way they are deployed. And I think that more and more, if you deploy an AI product that did not pass some sort of certification of auditing, it will not be competitive on the marketplace. So the market forces are also important. So there are many different ways to regulate, um, and uh, some of them come you know, more bottom-up from the communities actually uh, um, uh, creating AI. Some of them come from government, but uh, uh, one thing is to make sure that uh, when regulators like governments are uh, understanding how to want to regulate AI, it's important that they are educated into what the technology is uh, so that they can drive it in the right way because uh, they cannot just understand the technology as complex as AI just by reading titles or newspapers or magazines or, you know, that are very, you know, maybe putting together bias with Terminator or with, uh, you know, confusing the picture, you know. So it's really very important that regulators are educated about a technology before being able to, um, to, to, to actually, you know, decide on a law that then can, has to be applied. Thank you. I'd like to speak to similarities and differences. So. Every participant in society, whether a human or a corporation or an AI, um, needs to follow the ethical principles of the society. And by doing this, they witness to the trust, their trustworthiness as members of the society, and they also get and support the concrete benefits of cooperative behavior. But humans are different. They, they need, they have those shared responsibilities, but humans are unique and irreplaceable. Unique in the sense of having information content, a huge amount of information content in their genetics, experience, memories, relationships, 
and irreplaceable because this information cannot be recovered if it's lost. Now, a long-lived robot, which we're a long way from creating, could well be unique, could possibly be unique because of its accumulated experience um, and its memories. Um, but it can potentially be backed up and restored in case of loss. So it's not irreplaceable, which makes a big difference. We act in fiction in Battlestar Galactica, we saw the Cylons could be destroyed and recovered. Um, adult humans, and corporations for that matter, um, are considered responsible for their decisions and their actions and the consequences of those actions. Children and animals are also agents, but they're not considered responsible, but some person is considered responsible for them. For the foreseeable future, I believe that robots, even the most intelligent robots, will be in the category with children and robots, children and animals, sorry. It's not even clear what it could mean for a robot ultimately to take responsibility for its actions. Um, I'd like to applaud as one step in the right direction the EPSRC principles of robotics that were put out in 2010, along with these various other things that people have cited. And I'm going to summarize these, not enumerate them. Robots should be designed for safety, never primarily to kill or harm humans. Humans, not robots, are responsible agents. And that whenever you're dealing with a robot, you need to be able to find the responsible person. And robots should not deceive humans by concealing their nature as machines. Great, thank you. Um, I mean, this leads directly to the sort of next question. And I think, I'm sorry, I should say, I'm sorry it's so hot in here, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, you know, we're all um, suffering together. I want to. Ah, I need to formally, it would appear, allow the gentlemen to take off their jackets. I um, took the prerogative of taking mine off when I came in here, but absolutely, if the gentlemen would like to do that, um, <laughs> that would be excellent. Um, I'm going to try and. Yes, I have. Um, I'm going to try and whiz through just one more question uh, before I open it up for discussion. Um, and we've covered this, but uh, the question is, what are the areas where we have a moral responsibility to deploy robots? And where is deployment ethically wrong? And I wonder if the panel could um, think past uh, military applications, because in a way, I think there'll be broad agreement that, this, that we shouldn't use these... Uh, well, who knows, actually, in such an audience, but um, there'll be much more consensus about military use um, than other uses, actually. So I wondered if the panel could very briefly um, address this issue about, um, you know, where we should really deploy um, robots and where it would be ethically wrong to do so. Um, where will we start this time? Who would like to? Yes, okay. Happy to go first. Um, there are obvious applications where you would think that you should build robots if you can build them. Uh, one example is uh, a nuclear reactor with a core meltdown where you need to send people inside to clean it up because otherwise the danger is huge for the surrounding population, right? And it could be devastating. In that case, uh, going in and looking around and interacting with people and performing actions inside is perfect for a robot. Uh, these robots will be dysfunctional after an hour because of the strong radiation, but they can do the job and contain uh, the, the nuclear material, for example. Right? Similarly, there are search and rescue scenarios where you would want robots to do it. Uh, there are uh, other cases where uh, there's human hardship, right, or even human dignity involved, uh, where you would want the robot to perform a job that would be difficult for people to do. Uh, where should we not do it? I would like to make a strong statement that we should be very careful with particular types of social robots, especially the kinds of social robots that generate uh, emotional bonds on the human side, where humans engage with them, form attachment relationships, right? The uh, relationships that the robot cannot reciprocate because the robot may not understand them or maybe because the robot can exploit them. This is, there's a wide range of robots that fall into that category from uh, personal companions and, and, and pets, but also to sex robots. So these kinds of robots potentially have a huge impact on our society in that they could alter the social relationships we have with people. 
Thank you. Yes, if I could ask you all to be brief, because I want to sort of open it up shortly. Well, while I have the mic in my hand, I will be brief. Uh, the simplest way to answer this question is we should deploy robots when they can save lives. We should not deploy them when they kill people. Now, that's very simplistic. I, there's all sorts of variations of kill and save and so on. I do think that we have a moral responsibility to deploy driverless cars. They can save lives. Um, I think that we have a moral responsibility in medical applications where they can help clinicians and doctors save lives. Um, I even think that there's potentially a moral responsibility um, to use what people are calling biased algorithms when at least the decisions are uniformly applied in a biased manner, but we have to de-bias those algorithms. And finally, in terms of military applications, I mentioned already that AI-based uh, robots uh, can potentially actually be better than human targeters. Shouldn't we then have a moral responsibility for deploying them? <clears throat> Yeah, so unfortunately, I also agree with a lot of what was already said. I, I also think there is probably two sides of the spectrum. There is the one side where, it's where we should really use robots. And the examples have already been um, mentioned, right? If we have surgical robots that are better than human doctors, of course, then the state of the art would be responsible to let a human perform the operation. Same comes true for autonomous cars, obviously. If at some point, we might think it's irresponsible to let a human drive a car. And I guess the same comes true for all kinds of jobs that are somehow dangerous, so disaster relief, nuclear plants, all of that. That's one side of the spectrum. The other side, it's also relatively easy to say, well, of course, probably autonomous weapon systems, um, any kind of weaponized robots, probably we're going to have consensus about that, that we should either ban it or have some restrictions. Also easy. I think the interesting part actually happens in between, right? Where you don't really have an ethical responsibility to deploy a robot, but it's also not very really ethical wrong to do it. And that asks, like that forces the question, what kind of responsibility do we have as a society? Right? Is it ethical to automate all the jobs that we have? Are we going to deal with a future where it's very uncertain what kind of skills are going to be required? Are we going to be able to reskill everybody on the, on, the, on the market, basically? Or are we going to be fighting over jobs? And I think this is where the interesting um, discussion should happen. Great. OK, I hope you're all thinking of your questions while we have some comments on this side. OK. So, uh, yeah, so I agree with most of this being been said, but uh, I want to make the point that uh, um, I think that AI should be deployed to uh, augment our own capabilities, whatever we do. So the final decision makers is the human, in my view, uh, apart from maybe very trivial and repetitive you know, decision that you may want to delegate, but not the ones with the moral or ethical uh, you know, um, um, uh, agencies there. And so to me, that's the purpose of AI. And so that is the principle that should guide and understand where it's morally acceptable to deploy or not deploy. Uh, whether it's in the military or in the in a, a system that, for example, can affect how our children are growing up because they grow up maybe too attached or too, uh, to a technology or with long-term uh, effects that we, we have to still understand, you know, so, and all the other uh, applications. So to me, the, there should be some principles rather than just uh, uh, looking at specific application and say this yes, this no, this yes. I mean, it should be a principle. And for me, that's one of the principles that I think about. Um, I guess I need to say flat out that killing, killer robots are ethically wrong and that we simply have to, have to prevent that. What? From an ethical perspective, killing a human being is wrong. There are certain situations where ethical principles can conflict. And arguably, there may be situations where killing another human being is the lesser of evils. But that decision is not one that we have any clue how to implement in a robot and for a robot to take responsibility. We may or may not ever be in a position to delegate that, 
decision, but we certainly can't do it now. Killer robots are also very likely to be a really bad idea. So anyone who wants to think about this at all should definitely watch the short video, Slaughterbots, which is easily available on the web that shows how this can get out of control. Now, switching to the issue of where we should deploy robots, there are certainly dull, dirty, dangerous tasks that need to be done, and today people do them mostly because our robots simply aren't that capable. And so I think Matthias raised a good example if you need to clean out a nuclear reactor after a disaster. That's perfect. Um, now, for these dull, dirty, dangerous jobs, if those jobs can be done by robots, then perhaps robots should do them. But I only say perhaps. Some of the people who do those jobs actually want to do them, and they would object strongly to having them taken away. So, for example, space exploration is actually very dangerous. Um, and I think if that were taken away from humans and given totally to the robots, that's a bad thing. Um, coal mining. Now, most of us are probably not coal miners and probably don't want to be coal miners, but there are people who are coal miners who really want that job. Science fiction gives us a lot of interesting insights into these things. And Jack Williamson wrote a story in 1947 called With Folded Hands. Think about that. And it describes a dystopia where all powerful robots prevent humans from taking any risks, including working. So one of the things we need to ask ourselves is, when is work, particularly meaningful work, an important benefit of human life and needs to be protected? I don't think robots are inconsistent with that, but the notion that we would take away work from human life is adding to poverty. Thank you. Okay, I've been told that I don't have my three, my two minutes. So uh, I'll try to do that quickly. So what I'm going to do, uh, especially for the students in the hall, don't do this during exams, please. Do it once you have tenure. Question the question. It's, it's a wrong question. You never do this in an essay. You get no terrible marks. But here, I can afford that. Uh, why is an ill-conceived question? Because it's like asking, are there areas where we should and shouldn't deploy electricity? Like, really? Like, I don't know. I mean, depends. Which is what you heard so far. Depends. Because, uh, say, sex robots. Well, that might be a good idea if that replaces a human being as a prostitute or emotionally binding robots. That's an excellent idea already in place for kids with uh, special emotional difficulties. It's a fact, Google it. So it depends. Uh, since it depends, what you get out of this is an answer that gets uh, everywhere. It's not a magic key to the question. There's something wrong with the question. Uh, and what's wrong with the question? That essentially doesn't allow for an intelligent answer. It allows for a pub answer. It depends. Uh, and on that, I think each of us, with some intelligence in this room, can probably come up with a thousand examples on the one hand, on the other hand, to make sure that it depends. Thank you.